sunlit world of what he believes to be reality. But there is, unseen by most, an underworld, a place that is just as real, but not as brightly lit. A dark side. Well, here we are. Welcome to our first official Talks from the Dark Side. We're going to be talking about Tales from the Dark Side, the episodic horror show from the 80s and uh and we're gonna we have our special guest chris Barr, with us who's gonna be taking this journey with us because we're going through every fucking episode of this it's gonna be great i can't wait to talk about all these uh i have bad news i watched dark side of the rings that's what we were doing oh fuck (laughs) oh fuck wait that's not what we're talking about I can I can tell you all about uh, Jake the Snake Roberts' life and how depressing it is. Oh, great! Uh, all right, cut. <laughs> That's it. End. The, it. We're we were already stopping this. So is it already too late for me to admit that I watched uh, Dark Fate instead of uh, <laughs> this one? <laughs> Shit! Son of a bitch! Yeah, I watched the Transformers one. Getting ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> is that the one with Letter Nimoy? Dark Side of the Moon, is that what it's called? I think it is, right? That was that one was actually pretty good from what I remember. Oh, the Transformers movie. Oh, uh, yeah. I also watched Star Trek Into Darkness, and I was really confused. You're like, where the hell is George Romero in this? Benedict Cumberbatch's face is awfully sharp, but, you know, I'm not terrified. We're off to a good start. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Just what I want to talk about, fucking Michael Bay shit. Um, so, yeah, so I want we want to just, like, introduce, introduce Chris a little bit. He is, uh... Longtime friend of mine, um, and we've been talking about uh, getting this going for a while. So we figured, hey, let's bring it into the uh, the MDU, if you will, and uh, and get this get this going. Yeah, we've been talking about this for a long time now. We've been talking about this for a long time. Um, we're gonna get into a little bit of history of this, uh, you know, individually and together. Uh, but basically, I just we just want to run you down, Chris. Chris and I have. Um, done a ton of uh projects together including uh outhouse uh which won uh a chiller uh the chiller channel monster mashup competition we were broadcast on television that was a fucking great time um and we also uh did our field of screams project um that we're working on as we speak there's a trailer out there too so stop right there asshole <laughs> and sean- yeah with with sean as a cameo as the cop in there i actually uh i i played uh i, I dug up uh outhouse at work like uh, last year and I was like, hey, yeah, check this out. <laughs> uh, spoilers, there might be some type of release coming out this year at some point. So so keep your eyes peeled for that. Yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we've done a ton of film projects together and, and we work together and write together and, and shoot together and, and all that wonderful stuff. Um, but um, enough about us collectively. But Chris, um, you're working on some stuff, uh, some solo stuff. Yeah, right now, um, kind of the newest thing I'm doing and just, you know, besides, um, you know, I do some photo stuff here and there, just like, you know, fine art stuff on the side. But, um, you know, specifically horror related, I am uh, just launched a new uh, Instagram page, you know, highlighting uh, horror sound checks and things like that called Tape Hell. So um, that's really exciting, kind of combining VHS art and box art and stuff with the actual soundtracks. So um, that's been really fun to do. And I'm, uh, yeah, getting it off the ground, so... Yeah, if you want to check it out, it's called Tape Hell on Instagram. At Tape Hell? Yeah. I just followed you. Awesome. <laughs> You're checking it out as soon as we finish this up. Sweet. Yeah, was, uh, yeah, just trying to get the ball rolling on that. But uh, yeah, doing a focus on soundtracks. And um, I think it'd be something fun to do. I mean, there's a whole world of them out there. So yeah, lots to pick from. Totally. And you sent you sent me some cuts uh, that you've been working on, and they're fucking great. So oh, thanks. Um, all the best of luck with that, because it's going to be fucking sweet. Thank you. Thank you. So here we are. Tales from the Dark Side. What else, what, what what can be said about this show? It is, for me personally, this is my go-to cozy uh, uh, sh- TV show. I've seen this entire series, I've seen every episode at least three times, and, and other episodes subsequently more. But I gotta tell you something, like, this was like, I remember a lot of times like coming home from school. Now, I, obviously I didn't watch it when it premiered because I wasn't even fucking born yet. But um, in the 90s, sci-fi used to run um, reruns of this show 
um, in the afternoon. So I'd come home from school and I'd watch like the 90s Twilight Zone and the Friday 13th, the series and, and Monsters and, and Tales from the Dark Side. Um, and that was the only way you can really get it at the time unless you had the tapes. And even the tapes weren't, you know, the complete season. So so um, I know Thriller Video had put out some and uh, World Vision Entertainment, is it? Yeah, World Vision. That's actually how I, how I got started on them was the World Vision tapes. Um, what was they, Were those releases similar to the, the Tales from the Crypt releases where it's like, here's four episodes? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there was like two or three random uh, episodes like on a tape. So Okay, so it's like volumes, like what MST3K used to do where it's like, here's volume four and it's like seven episodes from four different seasons. Exactly. Yeah, it'd be sort of like uh, the best hits where it'd be ones that were like more popular that just put together on a on a VHS and then the next one could be you know all sorts of different ones from other seasons so um it was all over the place yeah so it was hard to even uh sort of catalog them or kind of get them all in one place unless like you unless you like taped it right off television um and it ran for a long time like the reruns ran until what until jesus i want to say like 2000 15 2014 jesus yeah they were running for a while because uh, yeah. cbs eventually got the rights and they just you know milked them as much as they could you know throwing them on late night on reruns like you said sci-fi channel ran them you know sometimes like two o'clock in the morning yeah well i was watching i remember watching tales like even as like not even that long ago only like five or ten years give or take um again like when i come home from work too it would be that way when uh when sean when you and i worked at heart true that's what i would do i'd come home and then i'd watch him so like late afternoon you know oh nice yeah um but um cbs ends up getting the rights like uh chris said and puts them out on dvd and then that was like the first time you had access to all the seasons so you had you there's four seasons which we'll get into um, but it was awesome to have them all in one place. The biggest difference between, you know, uh, having those discs and having those tapes is that the original music is not intact. So they had to like rescore the whole, uh, series to get, uh, to be able to legally release them because they couldn't get the rights for some reason for the, for the music. Yeah. They swapped the music all around and like re-recorded everything. And uh, but what a nice release those uh, DVDs were. Oh yeah, it's like like you're just saying. It's like how they were sort of mismatched all over with the with the VHS and you know reruns that you didn't know when they're coming on. The DVD release, it's like they just cleaned everything up, put everything in order by season, you know, obviously. But it was uh, just a really nice package to have. It's like the show that's just sort of been all over the place all kind of organized and it was like just so cool once they finally put that out yeah absolutely so uh so with that being said i guess we can get into a little bit of the history of the show if uh listeners aren't familiar so creep show comes out in 1982 and uh it, ha it you know there's a moderate success it it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't the the cult classic that it is now right it's it you know, we, we had, you know, there's all kinds of places like Cavity Colors and, and, and uh, you know, Fright Rags and all these different places doing creep show stuff. And, and um, it wasn't this huge hit when it came out. Um, and now it's it's really found its audience, and and it's, I'm so happy for that because it's such a great movie. Probably one of my favorites. Uh, it's up there. Oh, yeah. And it's an anthology film, right? So it checks all the boxes for me based off the old EC Comics you know, a lot of a lot of great effects by Tom Savini um, and directed by George Romero and written by fucking Stephen King and George Romero. Like, that's amazing. It's like a, it's like a it's like a best of kind of <laughs> kind of movie, you know? Yeah. And that's the best part about Creepshow. I mean, it's like, yeah, today it's considered a classic. But for then, what it did is it put together all these, you know, big names in horror and just they all joined forces and like came together and just put that put together this uh you know little anthology which is such an awesome thing yeah <laughs> a sort sort of a ec avengers yeah kind of <laughs> horror directors <laughs> yeah it's like those guys all set out to you know to do something that inspired them you know like what the ec comics like tales from the crypt fault of horror haunt of fear all those comics from the 50s that were just all horror sci-fi themed and they wanted to do their own version of it, and the out came Creepshow. I actually discovered Creepshow uh, by renting the, the the comic from like the library, 
and then finding the movie later. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, also, I have this was like you listed those shows earlier, like what was it Monsters, um, uh, 90s Twilight Zone, Outer Limits, mm-hmm. Friday Thirteenth. Uh, this is the this is the show I've never seen. So this is my first time watching this today. Oh wow! Oh, that's exciting then. Yeah, yeah, it's super exciting. Yeah, same same here. <laughs> so you have two 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 veterans and two virgins. So this is gonna be good. I remember monsters, and actually, monsters comes up at work all the time. Like people were like, "You remember that show with the fucking family?" And that's so weird. Out of all of those, it's like that's the one that comes up. That's the one that comes up from the like yeah, in this weird microcosm of people at a veterinary hospital. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Well, d- I think because it ran on USA. If I'm remembering correctly, yeah, yeah, it was. that and um, uh, Dark Shadows was the other one that I was constantly watching because, like, it, I just consumed so much sci-fi, and for for some reason, never caught this, but caught so much fucking Dark Shadows is not even funny. Well, yeah, my my girlfriend's a big Dark Shadows fan. She's seen so many episodes. Well, because there was a whole resurgence of that, wasn't there? It, um, oh yeah, they yeah. Did, they did like a Dark Shadows remake for television. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like. Uh, what I was watching, I think it was a kid, it was like definitely the old cheap 60s one where it's like that headstone just fell over in the background and it's very clearly made of foam. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens after Creep Show is, you know, George Romero and Richard Rubenstein kind of team up and, you know, they're like, OK, we want to do more short form horror stories. And. You know, it was it's so hard it, at the time. It was so hard for them to get. You know, they had success with Creep Show, but it wasn't enough to warrant another one at that particular time. So, so real quick, how, how does Creep Show two happen then? If if you don't mind, I didn't really look that up. Oh, okay, <laughs> sorry, I was just curious. If you don't know, no, just... no, you're good. <laughs> I I don't know. Let me, re- <laughs> let me research Creep Show two real quick <laughs> <laughs> because Creep Show two is kind of like it, it's fine, but it's I feel like. It was like the kind of bastard child of Creepshow at sure. the time, you know what I mean? And it's not as well, re- and it was it was really poorly received then, and now it's that's try- finally getting its audience, you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm a fan, but um, how about Creepshow three? We can go into that. Uh- <laughs> Don't even. What are you talking about? That movie doesn't exist. I've never actually finished it. To be honest. Wait, 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 hold, wait. I'm sorry. I know there's a TV show that Shudder picked up for Creep Show as like a new series, but I didn't know there's a fucking third one. Oh, you, oh, check it out. You'll <laughs> you'll love it. Uh, I, okay. Your your tone of voice is a little sus. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be uh, to be perfectly honest, it's like it's like a high school production. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the level no. Creep Show Three is at. And that's being nice. And it's a shame because it's like, how did these people get in touch with with whomever they needed to to get the rights for that, right? Uh, That's super funny that we talked about Hellraiser before we started recording because Revelations is like, you're like, oh, you filmed this in your friend's living room. That's fantastic. There you go. That's that's fucking Creep Show three. Uh... But just real quick, yeah, Connor. Um, yeah, that Creep Show's that Creep Show series was was uh, is brand new. Yeah, and I think they got renewed for a second season, but we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But so right, so Creep Show has moderate success. George Romero and Richard Rubenstein want to uh, create short form horror, so they're like, okay, it's. It, it's probably going to be too expensive to do this in an actual production, like film production format. So let's shoot a pilot and see if we can get it picked up and do it a, a, a TV series. Obviously lower budget, but it puts everything kind of in a box so that they can create and have all these different stories and bring all these writers in and, and all this other young talent, like young filmmakers and things to uh, kind of showcase um their their talents for the horror genre and keep it kind of going right because they want to keep this this uh short form horror and kind of anthology type uh storytelling going yeah and for a while there's actually like right off of the uh you know piggybacking off of creep show after the release when they wanted to start doing more you know short form stuff like this there was actually talks for a little bit of you know doing a creep show series so that almost happened. It's like Tales from the Dark Side was almost Creep Show the show, huh? Which is a uh, pretty interesting. And I think it wasn't Creep Show the show because they, again, like the re- retaining the rights. I, I feel like it was a rights thing. No, like I feel like the production or or or, or you know the 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 company who owned the rights to the movie was like, no, we're gonna fucking not do that, and we're gonna make Creep Show two instead. So maybe that's the answer for that. 
Yeah. And they also wanted their own creative control too. It's like, instead of, you know, doing everything under the creep show banner, it's like they wanted to not do specifically horror, but do some sci-fi, some drama as well. So that's another reason why, you know, they went with Tales from the Dark Side. I was going to ask, uh, what is the uh, target audience for this show roughly? Like, is this, you know, is this aimed at adults or, or teenagers? Because it doesn't seem like, you know, like monsters. I've seen a couple episodes of that, and that is definitely aimed at a younger audience. But I wasn't really sure about this. No, I I, I think you're incorrect on that one, too. Because, so we so the, so they shoot a pilot which we're going to be talking about. That's the main focus of this episode later. Um, they, they shoot a pilot in 83, and then it gets picked up for syndication in 84. Now, when this is created and, and ran, the first, the first um, season of this was aired um, on Tribune Broadcasting, and they did it, like, super late at night. Really? Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was intended, f- like, late-night scary shit for adults. Okay, cool. Or kids that were staying up late. Sure, sure. <laughs> right, right, right. You got their little, they got their little portable TVs under their blankets in their beds yeah. or whatever. <laughs> right. Ah, uh, that's such a romantic idea that I love. Right. Like, sure. In under your Ghostbusters fucking blanket <laughs> with your little TV watching Tales from the Dark Side while everybody's asleep with a little bowl of popcorn under there. Oh, there you go. Yeah, a little sandwich, a little something. I don't know. Little snacks for sure. Leftover Halloween candy probably. So yeah, the series is episodic. Of course, and, and that's the, like the the best thing about this series, and that's why you can enjoy this kind of whenever. That's why those VHS releases work, right? Because there's you can you can present them out of order, and it's not a big deal because there's no overarching story to it. Everything is consolidated in that in those twenty two to twenty five minutes. Yeah, and they go for all sorts of different uh, material too. It's like even if there's uh, you know some you don't like, there's still going to be some that kind of you know. Uh, really get to you and it's like there's a couple more you know ones that are a little more sci-fi a couple more you know horror ones but uh it's like they sort of just shot for everything and the, that's the beauty of having you know an a, uh, anthology series is just you get to do anything you want and cover like all sorts of bases for uh you know all the different uh, genres and everything yeah absolutely so yeah so they get this show so rubenstein and romero get the show off the ground and um and again you know it, it's like a it's like a rights issue with Warner, and they kind of wanted to do their own thing, like Chris said. So, so what? What do they do? They adapt another. They de- they adapt stories from like Stephen King. Um, there's a couple of episodes uh, that were written by Stephen King for this show, and like people like Frederick Paul and Harlan Ellison, and even Clive Barker has has an episode, um, which we'll get to. <laughs> uh, Michael Bishop, Robert fucking Block, not Robert Robert Block, uh, John Cheever, uh, Michael McDowell, and and Frederick Brown. So. You know how like novelizations were like a big thing too. Like you always had your movie and your novelization, or or the novel, you know, the novel based on the TV or the movie. CB knows all about that. CB knows all about that. Um, like we did for Child's Play three, where the you know we we talked about the novelization <laughs> yeah. of that. Better ending in the book. <laughs> so what's crazy is Tales from the Dark Side was adapted into novelization a novelization in eighty eight. Oh yeah, Tales from the Dark Side volume one. Need to, I'd love to get my hands on one of those. Yeah, seriously. But does it have uh, corporate espionage involving a diamond heist? <laughs> and, then every now, and then every now and then it just kind of casually cuts back to like the horror, and then is like, "Hang on, never mind, never mind that shit." Back to the intrigue. So this so this series runs from eighty four to eighty eight, and there's four seasons of this show, and you know they're they they really tried hard to keep it alive at the end by even shooting um, some episodes and trying to do like offshoots and things, but ultimately it died. However, we did get a film in nineteen ninety. Um, which is, again, it's right up there. I mean, it's r- literally directly behind Creepshow in terms of ranking uh, <laughs> for me. Yeah, and there's, you know, when we get to that point, it's like there's so much to talk about with the movie. Yeah, we I just we just kind of want to brief you on the series history and where it goes, and we're going to be breaking all, all these episodes down one at a time and then uh, leading up to the film. It's fine. We're not talking about Smallville. I'll survive. <laughs> Well, each episode is different, so you don't have to, you know, you know, filler episodes don't exist, yeah, don't right? <laughs> that that was the like filler episodes where I, was, I lamented the decision to cover CW TV episodically. I was like, I want to fucking push my thumbs into my eyeballs. Connor, I've already <laughs> told you that I am the uh, the, the 
the master filler after all the fucking anime I fucking watch. <laughs> just the filler, just it just it runs through my fucking veins at this point. How many episodes of One Piece are there now? Five hundred and ninety-nine, or excuse, no, no, excuse me, nine hundred and fifty-nine as of this recording. Fuck no. <laughs> No, thanks. I can't do it. I just can't do it. You gotta do it. I need an abridged version uh, that you need to write up for me of which ones to watch. Okay. <laughs> Sean's like, here's a 40-page document. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll try to keep it under 20. <laughs> he just drops this, this like, very heavy stack of papers. <laughs> the dossier of One Piece. Here you go. Yeah. So, yeah, like we said, it, it get its initial release is by tri- uh, the Tribune Broadcasting. Um, and then it gets picked up for syndication, which... You know, they run through they run through their production all the way to the end, and then it's picked up by LBS Communications for um for another uh, syndication. Like they would just uh, re air it. Yeah, this thing they pass this thing all around. Yeah, it's all over the place, and then it gets distributed by Laura Moratella Pictures, and then World Vision, like we discussed in the beginning, the 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 VHS uh, that was released of these films or these uh, this TV series, um, picks it up. And, and now CBS uh, Television has it. Yeah, and World Vision was like the precursor to CBS. So like World Vision turned into CBS. Yeah, which is hilarious. Yeah, that's fucking nuts. <laughs> doesn't doesn't CBS also currently own Twilight Zone? Uh, yes, that's interesting. Yeah, so they're they kind of hold. Uh, yeah, they hold both of these. They have the monopoly on anthologies. We got to break these assholes no, up. They, they gotta they gotta they gotta buy shutters. So they can they can get Creep Show, and I think they have another anthology series in there too. Oh, they have uh they have Channel Zero on there, I believe, uh, too. They have um they also have Monsters as well. So they and they distributed those tapes. They have them all. Yeah, they sure do. But I, you know, I think one of the lasting things that really made an impact on people when you talk about this show is the intro. Yeah, that that creepy intro. Yeah, narrated by Paul Sparer. Um, every time I wear like my Tales from the Dark Side shirt to like a con or something, s- without fail, one person, unsolicited, starts reciting <laughs> the intro of the of the show yeah that's what that's the part that sticks out the most and we end up doing it together like they're just like man lives in the sunlit world of what he believes to be reality like paul's voice there is something about it and the music and the score um which is done by Don- donald rubenstein who is uh uh, Richard's brother, and with and all of that intro was written by George Romero, by the way. Yeah, so it's like we have like the East Coast, like Charles and uh, you know the East Coast bands with us. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're right. More or less. Yeah, one producing, one doing the music. It's the bands. They <laughs> they have a lot of shady shit going on in oh, Italy, though. Which absolutely. I don't th- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which I don't think Romero did. Yeah, not totally. Without a doubt. <laughs> But, um, again, like, that's one of those things that always sticks in your head. Like, even if you even if you know about the show and don't remember any of the episodes, you remember that fucking intro music and that voiceover, that narration. And even now, you know, I've seen this show a bajillion fucking times. If I'm watching this at night, like, before bed or something, and it's, like, in the house is completely dark and quiet... It fucking freaks me out still. Like when I watch it, I'm like, there's something about it that really unnerves me. Yeah, the the music, the voice, it all comes together. Even the like the the visuals of it, it's nothing out there. Yeah, it's not spectacular. It's nothing special at all. It's a couple shots of farmland, and uh, and a bridge. That's it. And like some trees, and 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 like a negative effect that turns it into like a a, a negative uh, look. Yeah, you know, with that nice cheap like inverted like flip, and then that logo that comes in is fantastic. Oh yeah, but it's like these cheesy like flips and wipes and stuff. And, but they're super effective, right? Like uh, you know, on anything else, you're like, oh, that's cheap. But for whatever reason, it just really, really works all together. And I think that's really what you know. I know we're talking about the intro now, but that's kind of the charm of the series as a whole. It's like it is cheap, it is low budget, but it works. Oh yeah. You know what? You know what I think it is? It's the sincerity of this series that I think has um, let it be as resilient as it is. You know, yeah, everybody is in on this 110 percent from from the producers to the writers to the to the filmmakers to to the effects people. I mean, everybody is just bringing the goods and they're having a fucking great time doing it. And I think that's why it's like held up so well. When you can tell that creators love the thing they're working on as it comes to the screen, like, usually those things are either revered for a very long time or do last a long time, like, in their actual initial run. 
Yeah. And and again, this is a perfect example of like how budget really doesn't affect a good story, you know? They didn't have a ton of money to make the most spectacular sh- shit, but like they they used what they had and they just had really good writing and and they had talented young people behind um all of these facets and they kind of put it together the best they could and uh made a great <laughs> series. So not only do we do we have that um that main theme, but a lot of music, a lot of the original music for these episodes was was written by John Harrison, um who is the composer of Creepshow. Oh, that kind of makes sense. I like the music a lot, and now that you mention that, I can kind of like see the uh, relation for sure. Well, here's the thing: not all of these have their original soundtracks. Oh, okay. What 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 is the issue with the soundtracks? Like, what did the person who owned it like? I don't understand like the the how that got you know muddled. Um, I think the rights lapsed on the original music, so it's like when they were doing the DVD release, they just had to just kind of come up with new stuff. Oh, it's so weird. I, only, I like I the only example in my head I can think of, especially for a TV show, is like one of those Dragon Ball Z dubs that came out later, where all the music was replaced and then subsequently replaced again because they were like, "You stole all of this." Oh, super! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, or or Kai, or I think it was. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I just I don't know too many instances where like a show comes out and they're like, yeah, all this music has to go. Well, it's like the only thing I can even think of uh, was Crazy Taxi, the uh, Dreamcast game and the arcade game. Whoa! When yeah. it, it came back out on like you know a couple of years ago on like live for PlayStation and Xbox, they lost a bunch of songs. Oh, uh, they did that for uh, Tony Hawk too. Oh yeah, for the yeah, new, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tony Hawk game. Yeah, they had to just. Re, you know just get new songs yeah and some of the uh some of the games that like people have purchased in the past on old consoles are just missing from all marketplaces well because sure they that, have, that's a bigger issue yeah for they, sure. have, they have music in there that you can't that that wasn't licensed anymore so you can't actually buy the game it's so strange and like i don't think we're ever gonna get it but i mean fingers and toes crossed like a full restoration of this for like blu-ray that would be amazing like original film elements and like you know, new scans of that and like, you know, digitally restored audio and then the actual airing music would be fucking phenomenal. I don't think CPS is going to do that, but I hope one day that happens and that those elements are accessible. Yeah, it, uh, it also makes me think of, I mentioned those MSC3K volumes before and uh, like you could, there's no way to buy a season of that show because the, the like the, the rights handling is such a fucking mess. Well, yeah, that too, because of the movies and shit. Yeah, and in some cases, like the rights holders uh, to those movies just don't exist anymore. Like you're like, who do I talk to about right. this? I don't know. They're all dead. The co- Yeah, or the company's completely liquidated and it's like, who knows, you know? But you're right, Joe. It'll be interesting because I haven't seen these before. I wouldn't even know that this was not the original music until you just said that. Yeah, exactly. They did a pretty good job of matching it well enough where it feels like it's from that period you yeah, know it's been so long too for me personally you know since watching the vhs episodes you know on the tapes and everything i don't even remember what the old music was like me either i have no idea so nothing nothing really stands out too much as far as like you know the newer stuff in there goes got you yeah i would say it didn't nothing jumped out at me as far as like feeling out of place um it certainly has that uh, uh, the sound of the time where it's like meh, 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 like that kind of nineties <laughs> <laughs> <that> synth music. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. And they reuse it a lot, right, for the episodes. Like wherever they had to use new music, I believe I don't know how much was rewritten, but they reuse the same music a lot, I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. But yeah, John yeah, John Harrison all through this thing. Yeah. I mean, John Harrison's been the biggest champion. Now I mean now that you know, R. I. P. we've lost George, um, and Rubenstein kind of has an. I don't. Is he an executive producer on the new series Creep Show? Um, I th- I think he is. He might be. He has to. There, he's got to yeah. have some credit in there. We're gonna talk about his ass in a second. John Harrison finds himself writing and directing uh, a bunch of these episodes too, as we go throughout these. Um, and he's actually contributed to the new uh, Creep Show series, both musically and um, you know, directing wise and and um, writing. So that's interesting. Yeah, and it's like this was coming after, um, you know, right around the same time, George Romero and John Harrison, you know, collaborated on Day of the Dead. So it's like you, and that's actually my favorite part of Day of the Dead is the soundtrack. Yeah, it's really fucking good. Uh, I, okay, I listen to the the full score every Halloween. Yeah, it's so good. That music is awesome because it's like it is to me. It's super unconven- uh like unconventional for a horror movie. Um, 
mostly because it's it's very upbeat. And at some point, it just they're like like this is kind of catchy. I'm kind of bobbing my head. To it. <laughs> yeah, it fucking um, rules. That's also that's also my favorite of the original trilogy, uh, uh, Dead trilogy. So oh, me too. Yeah, by far. It's um, but it's like same kind of thing we were talking about before. It's like you have you know all these names like in this case George Romero and John Harrison, like all working together. You know, after Creepshow, you got Stephen King in there, and mm-hmm. then you know that brings us back to you know into Tales from the Dark Side, and it's like uh, even the uh, when the movie once they get to that, John Harrison actually directed that, which is a little fun fact. It's like you know goes to work on the music and everything with George, and then later on when they get to the movie version of this, it's like hey. Yeah, you're directing, and and it, if that's not a testament to the passion throughout this this lineage of projects and films, I don't know what is. You know, yeah, seriously. And here we are, in, you know, in 2021, and we're getting more creep show content. And I, I think that it's just like this long legacy of things, and I, I feel like people put tales and and uh to 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 the back. You know what I mean? When you should totally watch this series and and the movie too. I mean, they're just so excellent. Yeah, and it is easy to like write it off as just like some cheap, you know, low budget show. That's and he's like, oh, that show, I remember that. Yeah, I remember the intro. But it's like there's so much behind it, you know, like we're talking about, like behind the scenes and everything with everybody working together. It's like there's really a lot of history behind it. Mm-hmm. And the other thing too is like this show in history gets kind of muddied because of things like Friday the 13th the series and Freddy's nightmares and all oh, that kind of shit boy. you know that- <laughs> everything is everything is airing at the same fucking time you know what i mean yeah yeah and then you have this one just kind of you know trotting along doing its thing phases out and it's the best of the bunch by a country mile that's the other show i i never saw was Freddy's nightmares um i've like glanced at an episode i was like no fucking thank you like <laughs> <laughs> it's uh not great i was like this look i was like this looks criminally under budgeted um and like i, I didn't like i think i watched i don't know 10 minutes of one episode and I, I hated the freddy intro and then like it just felt like daytime soap opera level tv dressed up as a you know a freddy themed anthology series i was like this sucks <laughs> never went back yeah you're not missing much yeah we're not going to be talking about that one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh i want to talk about uh richard rubenstein a little uh, a little bit so through laurel entertainment right that was that was what his company was he either produced or executive produced a ton of romero um films you know, Dawn of the Dead, Martin was one of them, Night Riders, uh, Creep Show, of course, and, and Day of the Dead. And uh, Pet Cemetery, which I actually forget about. I f- always forget he had a like hand in that one. It's crazy like how this trifecta kind of stays intact in some way or another. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then going into uh, the 90s with him, it's like it's not like he did a couple big things in the 70s and 80s. It's like even now, it's like just, you know, before the episode, I was in there looking at, you know, IMDb credits. And uh, he's still going. He's actually an executive producer on the uh, the new Dune. Yeah. Whoa. He owned he owned the fucking rights to Dune and produced um, Children of Dune for sci fi. Oh. Oh yeah. In uh, what two thousand? Yeah. Yeah. So he's still going. Yeah. It's just boxers to think about that. Like Warner, that's coming out from Warner Brothers, right? Yes. Yeah. Warner had to go to Rubenstein and be like, "Hey, we're gonna make this new Dune movie. You in?" And he's like, "Yes." <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he's still going. <laughs> ah, you finally come crawling around. <laughs> Basically, he's like the he's like the Haim Saban, you know what I mean, uh, of this content. I would insult him like that by comparing him to Haim Saban. I was being, I was trying to be funny, <laughs> all right. But ironic, you know, he also produces monsters, which comes directly after this because Tales from Dark Side ends up getting canceled, and and it's a whole kind of mess at the end there. But then out from the ashes rises the phoenix, <laughs> you know, monsters, which is which is another we, we'll get there when we when we talk about it um but um but yeah it's it's just so crazy like he, he's got a very rich career and again he's kept again just like john and even george like he's kept in that same kind of vein throughout through this whole time he also are so stephen king is obviously a big part of creep show i mean he wrote all the stories i just i just realized i forgot that creep show 2 wasn't even written by king it was written by george Based on King's stories, he was too he was too busy. <laughs> yeah, Romero wrote he like adapted Stephen King's stories for Creepshow too. He's like, "Fuck you, I'm doing Maximum Overdrive." <laughs> if you need me, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be done coke in my trailer. Yeah, <laughs> where's Stephen? I just found a pile of uh, cough medicine and booze. 
<laughs> but yeah, Rubenstein produces that too. So, so it's still in the pocket while this shit's going on. You know what I mean? Yeah. While Tales is going on, Chris. You, speaking of uh, things that um, Rubenstein produced in the '90s, he did a bunch of Stephen King stuff too. Um, uh, oh yeah, let's let's talk about the Langoliers. <laughs> Yeah, please. Okay, is the is the Langoliers the one that ends with the uh, the hilarious little uh, uh, chompy bits? Yep. Yes. That that, <laughs> that is my only memory of that program. Like, what was it a, a movie or a limited series? It was a limited series. That is the only thing I fucking remember, and it is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Like, it's <laughs> so hilarious looking. Oh man, he also but he also did the stand, and I really like the stand. Yeah, he also did the stand, and that's that's a little that's a little higher in, in quality. That's uh, that's much better. Oh, for sure. Ha- have any of you guys watched the new one? Is that any good? Does anybody know? No, still not. I still haven't watched that yet, but. I heard, I heard good things. Is it out? If it's not, I know it's got to be soon. It's out, and the people I, I work with are watching it, and uh, they, they haven't had too many good things to say about it, and they're oh. very beholden to the original, apparently, and they, they love the story in the original movie, but they're not impressed with this at all. Well, I, I think Mick Garris really kind of nailed it the first time, so I'm kind of like, all right, I mean, I guess if you want to do it, sure, question mark. It's, like, kind of timely, too, in some weird ways. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, but he also does thinner, and he also produces one of my favorite King. <laughs> Sorry, I, well, I love thinner so much. Oh, thinner! It's great. a good flick. It's a good flick. Thinner. <laughs> I don't know how we haven't done it on the main show. It's got to happen. It's got Joe Montana, and he's coming back after this baby fucked his life up. Oh man, we'll we'll we'll, we'll definitely revisit that at some point but i also would like to visit one of my favorite uh 90s king adaptions which is the night flyer that that movie rules so- ooh what is that oh shit it's so fucking good it was produced for hbo i'm pretty sure and it was in the pocket too of like tales from the crypt which we're going to talk about but not yet <laughs> that's that's um that's the vampire with uh miguel uh ferrer right yeah the vampire on the airplane oh my god that sounds awesome already <laughs> I do it so good. I remember I was a kid and like I was at a friend's house and we came across the ending of that movie where he just like goes to well, sing on the fucking spoil- vampire. Don't, don't, don't spoil it. Don't spoil I'm it. I'm not saying what the ending is. I just got that saying, man, that sounds awesome. You're like, oh, I remember the end of the movie. <laughs> Wasn't detailing it. Um, and like for years going like, what the fuck was that movie where Miguel Ferrer is just in an airport with a vampire? <laughs> it's such it's such an excellent, excellent um flick it really is and i feel like that's one of the one of the most underrated of of king's movies to tell you the truth yeah it, that really doesn't get enough attention Mm-mm. um because it was like a made for you know it was a made for network movie but like i remember so vividly like watching that and it's shot really good and it, it, everything's great about it the effects are f- i think b did the effects on that too yeah i think they did actually now because i i watched it not that long ago and um there's parts that still like they're it's pretty creepy oh yeah and Miguel is, of course, great. R.I.P. And I always like the design of that vampire. He's because it's not. There's nothing romantic about that look. I'm like, that's just a bat with arms and legs. Like, <laughs> he's just hideous. He's so. Gross it's just looking. gross. Yeah. He's got like. I'm pretty sure he's got like one giant tooth on the top and bottom of his mouth. Yeah, and he's just got these very big, you know, ratty features up in his face, and like he's this gross hair. Yeah, but but he also from the neck down is dressed like a count. I was gonna say, but does he have like a cute? You know, bat butt like they do. You ever seen the bat butts? <laughs> I guess. Does he have a nice ass? That's in the uh, that's in the director's cut. Oh, okay. <laughs> the bat butt cut. Yeah, it didn't make it in the final one. Release the bat butt cut. The bat butt cut. Batman versus Superman. The the bat butt cut. Can we get that hashtag going? The the release the bat butt cut for Night Flyer. Oh God, Ben Affleck, um, the assless chaps. Yeah. No thanks. <laughs> So, uh, so in 2016, Joe Hill, who's a horror author, um, he wants to reboot this series. Oh, Joe Hill, Stephen King's son. And he, all, the, all the attempts fail. The shit just doesn't connect. So he ends up turning his script into uh, a four issue comic for, uh, I, I believe it's, it's, uh, IDW. Uh, so he does it for IDW and, um, but I don't know how I feel about this because it's like he wrote it. I guess for screen and was upset that he had that, that it turned into a comic book because he like fucking insults the people that are going to read it by calling them fucking man children. Yeah. It's sort of a weird story behind that. It's like, first it was going to be like, not quite tales from the dark side. It was just going to be called dark side. Yeah. And then after a while of more, you know, speculation and stuff and 
you know, not really anything happening on it. Then he's like, oh, yeah, it's going to be Tales from the Dark Side. The, the problem I have with it, too, is that it has this overarching story. And it's like, I don't fucking need it. I just don't. Um, if Correct me if I'm wrong, but when M. Night Shyamalan was going to reboot Tales from the Crypt, not only was it not going to have the Crypt Keeper, but he was also going to do like an overarching story. Yeah, he wanted to cut the Crypt Keeper and have like a narrative between each episode. That's... Uh, why well, I, which is wow, like just I, do a normal show then like what are you touching tales from the crypt for i've never been happier to to hear that, that show is dead <laughs> oh yeah yeah but but it's like you're you, you're bastardizing the whole point of the show so what are you why it's like what they did from you know you know, look at the kids version which is like uh are you afraid of the dark like that show now is has this overarching narrative and it's like who could give a shit like the best part was like you didn't know what was coming each week you know that also sounds like um the movie adaptation of scary stories to tell in the dark where it's like yes you could just do an anthology instead they came up with this like really silly way to tie all these stories together um, it's goosebumps. Yeah, exactly. But worse. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's not as good. Yeah, then you lose like what it made a special. Right, and you know what? That totally worked for that first Goosebumps movie. I thought it was great. I, you know, whatever. If you're gonna do a Goosebumps movie, that's that's the way to do that. I kind of like that. But when you do it for one of the things that scared the shit out of us as kids, you want to talk about scary? Like those Stephen Gamble drawings are one of the. They still give me fucking nightmares. But like, what you did, like what Guillermo did with that. Or he produced it, right? Did he write it, too? He produced it. Yeah, whatever. Anyway, the point is, like, Connor, you're 100% right. It should have just been an anthology movie, and it could have been scary as fuck. And it could have been one of our contemporary ones, like, for now, for, like, the the the, 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 the 2000, a really good 2000, like, mid-2000s uh, um, anthology movie, because we're kind of, we're missing that. I mean, we we, we did get Trick or Treat, which was good. I, I was going to say, I'm like, no one has been able to tug on that movie's cape in a long time, so like, that movie is still undisputed in this era. Which kind of blows my mind. You, th- you would think that anthology movies would not only be easier to produce, but be more satisfying? Yeah, and, like, wasn't the story of that movie is that, like, it was produced and Dimitrium was like, ah, oh, well, we don't know who's going to actually enjoy this, so we'll throw it in a vault for seven years. Um, and then just dropped it casually on like VOD and fucking DVD. And people were like, wow, this is excellent. Why wasn't it released in theaters? Sure. Uh, you know, trick or treat is definitely a, um, it's definitely like, oh, it's absolutely an anthology, but it's one of those ones that just kind of never stops going. It's like this whole, you know, we see characters from before in this story and, you know, the way that it's the way that it's structured, I guess. It's it's interwoven, but there's no larger overarching story. It's just it's it's the same location, so all these people keep running into each other, but you never like it never feels forced or like they're no stopping to do like a, you know, the, Thor's not going to the fucking cave of teasers to tell you about the infinity stones <laughs> right. or like that. Like <laughs> I I guess what I'm saying is I prefer my anthologies like Boom, here's a story. We stop. Boom, here's a story. Here's a stop. And then we have a wraparound. You know, that, that's kind of my that's my flavor that I like. And uh, Joe, it's funny you mentioned Trick or Treat because, you know, especially on this episode, you know, introducing Tales from the Dark Side because Trick or Treat is actually like, you know, originally it was a Tales from the Dark Side episode. Yeah. You know, like loosely, of course, but it's like you have, you know, the old man tormented by, you know, a little kid wearing a pumpkin suit. Oh Halloween shit! <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, not only yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, Halloween candy. Um, yeah, Halloween candy. It's like just like the pilot episode we're talking about, but you know, little da- later down the line. But yes, very, uh, you know, almost too similar to t- uh, Trick or Treat. When we get there, you got especially Connor. He's gonna be like, "What the fuck?" Because <laughs> it's. <laughs> It's the same thing. Yeah. Hopefully that it was taken. Hopefully it was taken as like uh, an homage or something. You know what I mean? Or, yeah, yeah. or in a lot of cases, like parallel thinking is it like it can happen even years removed the project. Like, I don't. I don't sure. Think it's oh, like of course. A, yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's 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 not as egregious as like Hunger Games and Battle Royale or something like that. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. just I'm just a little skeptical about the fact that Doherty may have seen <laughs> or has not seen you know the episode halloween candy of tales from the dark side which could be something that just inspired him I, you know yeah I mean? i'm sure it's probably kicking around his brain somewhere and he probably has this like long you know distant foggy memory of something he saw on tv and it was like yeah it's pretty not a bad idea <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but I mean, I guess that's where I mean that's where a lot of our inspiration comes from, you know, the, these old TV shows and and movies and stuff, and we kind of want to recapture the way they feel and the and the way those stories are told, you know. Not to make it cheap, to make it not only an honest story, but something that actually can scare you or make you laugh or, you know, what have you. So, yeah, there's one last thing I want to mention before we before we finally, finally jump into the pilot episode of this amazing series. Um, There are four unaired episodes of this series. Now, you two of them seem to be lost and the other two are included as bonus features on the on the on the uh, season four um discs of um tales from the dark side the 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 dvd set so if anybody has any information about those i looked i looked all over the place to to see to find a name or a plot description or even like some video that somebody might have had somebody was claiming that they had it on an old vhs recorded off television but never followed up with some other people so i don't know what the fuck the deal is with that but um it's very interesting and it's one of those kind of like grail things that i want to figure out and see or, or get some more information on yeah they have to be out there somewhere somebody has them on a tape just you know sitting there so but can you imagine tracking those down and actually seeing those? Right? Just on some old like VHSC or some shit yeah. like they were going to air but never did. Right? Sitting in the back of some production office. Yeah. And uh, so two of them, two, I, I think they were all made to roll into a new series because they're, they're happening towards the end of Tales from the Dark Side, the series Life. And they want to, you know, reignite the series and possibly start a new one. Right, I believe one of them was called Night Rose, Chris. Yeah, Night Rose, and the other one was what was the name of it? I don't know if there ever was there one. Did we find it? Did no, we talk I th- about it? I think it was just they were kind of kicking it around. Yeah, they were trying to kick one series around, uh, which I we don't even know if there is a name. And then that other one was Night Rose. Yeah, but without further ado, it's time to talk about the pilot episode for Tales from the Dark Side. Now, uh, the episode's called Trick or Treat, and its original air date was October 29th, nineteen eighty three. Which is pretty fucking badass, because we're, I mean, it's centralized around Halloween, so it's really cool to have a Halloween episode come out, like, right around Halloween. So it's almost like a Halloween special yeah. to sort of kick it off, you know? What a kickoff. Right? Yeah, right out the gate, you have a Halloween episode. Yeah. Um. So, like, th- that's such a great way to get that flavor and intention across of what this is, you know? Yeah, this just sets the stage for... What's ahead? Totally. So it's directed by Bob Balaban and written by Franco Amuri and George Romero. And you know what's funny? It's like five minutes before we started this episode, I looked up Bob Balaban. I'm like, that doesn't sound that doesn't sound familiar, but you know, let's see what else he's done. He's he's like the definition of that guy. Oh, he's one of them. <laughs> so what is he what does he work on? He's so he's more known as an actor. Oh, really? And I actually didn't yeah, I didn't know until yeah, right before we started this of what he's actually been in. He's like, so if you're on a computer or like, you know, on your phone, look up Bob Balaban. He's the director of this episode, but you've seen him in something else. Oh, he's a that guy for sure, man. (laughs) Yeah. He's done a lot of the, um, the Christopher Guest movies. He's in those. He's usually like a, you know, a doctor or something, but he's like very soft spoken and, you know, real like mousy sort of guy. Oh my God. Wow. Like, right. Like the tiniest (laughs) picture pops up. I'm like, I know exactly who that is. Yeah. That guy. (laughs) Oh, man, we are going to encounter some not only familiar faces, but big familiar faces. So, Chris, you want to do the honors? You want to plot crunch this? Uh, just a quick summary before we before we get into the meat and potatoes of this? Yeah, so Trick or Treat is, this is our pilot episode starting the series off. And really, it's about this, what do you say, like Scrooge kind of guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's a miser. Yeah. Yeah. Total like miser, total, you know, cranky old man and super rich and 
the entire town is pretty much in debt to him. Which I th- I think is my favorite part of this little thing, is that like somehow yeah. an entire town got bamboozled by this balding old man. <laughs> yeah. You have this like farming community, I guess it's implied that they live in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, somehow everybody in town has like their farm basically on lean to a guy that runs some like antique sh- antique shop. <laughs> yeah, it's like a it's like a general store or some shit. Yeah, sells candy and you know old uh, all sorts of stuff. But yeah, so the whole town is uh, you know owes this guy money. But this guy, it's like he loves Halloween, so it's like not quite Ebenezer Scrooge. But, uh, you know, instead of hating Christmas, he just loves Halloween. Yeah, yeah. so it's kind of like the anti-Scrooge kind of, well, sort of. Yeah, like the better version. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's the reign of the super Scrooges. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you, got, you got one for Halloween, you got one for Christmas, you got one for Easter. You got one. <laughs> Prune's in there somewhere, <laughs> Barnaby's in there. Oh, he sure DC is. Comics Presents, reign of the super Scrooges. <laughs> IDW written by <laughs> Joe Hill. So, so we open on uh, th- th- his store, his general store, and uh, we're introduced to Bernard Hughes playing Gideon Hackles. His name, uh, once I heard what it was properly, I just giggled because uh, the word hackles refers to the hair on the back of a dog that stands up when it's pissed off, <laughs> or like a cat too. Which I just thought was like, I'm like, that's real. That's a really good shitty name, like. <laughs> <laughs> He also has this really croaky, like, he talks like this the whole time. Marge, we a backwards town, backwards people. Cup of coffee? Four cents, fucker. Um, so he's played, so Gideon, Gideon Hackles is played by Bernard Hughes. And um, if you don't know who Bernard Hughes is, he is Grandpa from The Lost Boys. And uh, he also plays Walter Gibbs in Tron. Oh, shit. Uh, this man has a rich, rich, rich career, uh, acting career that spans decades Um. And he's just fantastic. He is the shining star of this episode, uh, hands down. Oh yeah, I mean he he, yeah. he is the focus. So also in uh, in this scene, we're introduced to uh, Mr. Bindle and Mr. Bundle, who are basically uh, you know uh, Gideon's um, uh, tax guys. His accountants, basically. Yeah, his accountants, more or less. Not Lewis Tully, though. They remind me of like like Sadler and Waldorf from fucking Muppets. Like this is <laughs> <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah, they're basically real life Muppets. Yeah, Bindle and Bundle. Yeah, basically. And the way this scene is shot is like some kind of like mafia deal. Like in a dark basement with a fucking light hanging over a poker table, it looks like. Yeah, he's even got his poker hat on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We also have uh, Max Wright playing Mr. Bundle, and he's Willie Tanner from uh, ALF. Oh, wow, I didn't even catch that. Yeah, the dad, right? Yeah, he's the dad. Uh, he's fucking great, man. I, I, uh, Alpha's another one of my favorite series. Uh, but Max Wright's here, and we got, uh, I.M. Hobson playing, uh, Mr. Bindle. And this guy has acted in a ton of shit as well. Chris, he's in Cabin Boy as the headmaster. Uh, Cabin Boy. I love that movie. (laughs) It's so good. (laughs) He's also in, uh, Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula, which I thought was interesting. Holy shit. Oh, yeah, Hobbs. So, basically, uh, you know, they're all getting together, and and we kind of get some insight into Gideon and, like, what he's about and how he's made his money, and he's just a curmudgeon old fuck. Um, And... It's it's basically illustrating the fact that, like, he's made a ton of money but never spends any of it. He just has it for whatever. Fucking Jeff Bezos, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he even has, that, he even has his uh, first penny framed. Yes, he does. Yeah. yeah. He's like, ah, it wasn't the, uh, what does he say? He says, it wasn't the inventions I made. It was the money I saved. Yeah, well, he, he's like, it wasn't my, my greatest inventions that made me the money. It's my simple ones, like right. clasps and Velcro and shit. Every now and then, I dive off a diving board into a giant pool of golden coins. <laughs> And children's tears. And I wait for my nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, to show up. <laughs> uh, he's got some great lines here, man. Like, he's, he, you know, he says some shit like, you know, I can afford a lot of things, but I don't want them. Like, he just yeah. wants to hoard for whatever reason because he's crazy. He's like fucking Smaug, man. He, he, you know, he doesn't spend any of the treasure. <laughs> he just keeps it and sleeps on it. I am fire. I am dead. <laughs> 
He makes some comment like, oh, oh yeah, Max Wright's like, why don't you just hire some people? Like, why the fuck? Oh, yeah. It's so dark because they, they he had them drive down from New York City at 3 in the morning so it didn't interrupt his business hours. It does, like, it, it looks super shady, too. I love it because, like, it's just one, like Sean said, it's a single light bulb just hovering over this, like, this table. Yeah. And, like, they appear to be in a black void, but just because nothing else is lit. And he doesn't have any, like, he doesn't have any hired help because he's like, oh, clerks steal shit. You know, they, they steal from you, so fuck them. Yeah. I'll just work these hours. And another key thing in this scene is, you know, you made that joke about how he, you know, the guy asked for a cup of coffee and he says four cents. Mm -hmm. uh, but the crutch of this whole, you know, scene is seeing that he has this whole stack of IOUs because he's like, ah, he's like, just write me an IOU. And he hands him this fucking, like, George Costanza wallet-sized stack of IOUs. Well, he's going to collect every penny that's due him, dude. That's his That's his MO. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, every cup of coffee. <laughs> he's like, I never overcharge and I never cheat. I just take things from people. You know, I lend people money and then hold them in eternal debt. Yeah, totally honest and, uh, yeah, super nice guy. All around. <laughs> exactly. He's one of the, like, he's he's one of the worst kinds of misers. He's like, I have all this money. I won't do anything with it. Uh, I won't help my community. I'll just keep sucking off these people's lives. Well, and it's like, you know, he must spend the money he has, like, on the things he knows these people need, and that's what he stocks his general store with. He's like, yeah, I have toothpaste, dog food, uh, dirt, um, you know, hose and uh, farming tools. Halloween costumes? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anything you could buy in this guy's store because he knows you need it and you're fucked if you don't come to him. And, uh, they, you know, they make a comment like everybody in the Valley owes him money like Chris was talking about. And, like, it's this sick power play that he has on this community. Oh, yeah. And it's at the expense of these people and he does it. Because and he waits all fucking year, right? He he puts these people in a position uh, like a uh, 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 a position of jeopardy with uh, financial jeopardy and then forces them to bring their kids to his house so he could scare the shit out of them and he hides like a big stack of their all their IOUs um and if they f and if the kids find them all their debts are forgiven I'm not sure on which end this is more fucked up on his or the parents who take their kid to this old man's house and he's like here go walk around and try to find some fucking papers well i think it's like they're both kind of at fault because there's this scene in his, his shop as a couple customers come in with this strung out dad who's like, yeah, I've been beating my boy real good so that he can handle getting scared. He's going to be there. <laughs> I've been putting the, the old kind of fear into him. I've been putting the strap to my boy, I, just, I think he says. I'll just dangle a loaded shotgun in front of his face around <laughs> So yeah, so so it's so uh, that wraps up and it's morning time and he has this like Pee Wee Herman ass fucking Ernest P. Whirl yeah! uh, uh, Rube Goldberg machine. Now this is cool though because it gives you a little bit more insight because he mentions that he's invented other things, and so he's just a really smart inventor guy too because he has you know he has all these little mechanical things that open up his shop doors and shit and later like at his mansion he has like all these not advanced animatronics but for like a sleepy town in the middle of bumfuck nowhere he's got like things on rails and uh uh uh, uh mechanics mechanical shit that yeah. he uses to scare people yeah with. yeah like if this if this podunk grapes of wrath town that he is enslaved uh is oz and he's definitely the fucking wizard behind his curtain just pulling levers and like you know spinning wheels so we're introduced to um uh mr kimball and little billy and they're brand new to the valley and they already owe this motherfucker money like they have their farm is already on lean from this guy um and it's their first halloween Right? So he's like, oh, is your little Billy going to come to my house and try to get your fucking IOUs or whatever? Yeah, here's where we get all that exposition. Where he's like, come here, Billy. I'm going to tell you all about what we're going to do. And they make it sound like really perverted at first. And you're just like, what the fuck are these people signing their kids up for? Yeah, he leans over, whispers in his ear. He said, come here, Billy. It's like, you're coming to my house tonight? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a there's a predator uh like side of it where you're like so y'all just send your kids to this old man's house at night on Halloween and you're just like well best of luck to you and just <laughs> push them into the door. I mean he's still like 
He's still, like, a sick in the fucking head, don't get me wrong. But they definitely paint it, like, something way more sinister. Because the dad's like, I ain't gonna send my boy there, and I'm surprised they, the other parents send their kids. It makes me sick. Some parents make their children do it. Yeah, he, like, mumbles that under his breath. And I'm like, holy shit, what is happening on Halloween at this guy's house? Yeah, the parents are scared of the guy, and they're just sending their kids over there to, like, clear their debt. Yeah, well, yeah, as, as we find out for sure. But I was like, whoa. Kimball's like, oh, the fucking IOUs probably aren't even in the house. And he's like, oh, oh, the IOUs are in the house. You know, I don't cheat. Yeah, like almost offended by it. Yeah. yeah. Because he's like, he thinks he's such a straight fucking shooter, man. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, I don't cheat. I don't have to. People make their own misfortunes, is what he says. <laughs> what is he, Jigsaw? Like, <laughs> Yeah, he's like, oh, I, oh he's, they're hidden in a really obvious space. People just choose not to see it. And, and then like, when they show where he hides this, I'm like, okay, I guess you have to at least hide it just because that's part of the game. But, like, you really, like, you think people are sticking their arm in two feet into a fucking fireplace? I don't think so. This is such a this is such a weird thing, and it kind of dawned on me when I was watching this. I've seen this a bunch of times, right? And I watch it for Halloween every year. But it really dawned on me now because I was analyzing it, right, for the show. Sure. And um, I was thinking to myself, like, is he, like trying to find the kid that is strong and willed enough to kind of find these things and then what like pass his his fortune on to them what is he willy wonka his chocolate factory yeah <laughs> So it's like Willy Wonka and Halloween. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he, well, he sits there in his little mechanical chair, and he's like, I will transfer my essence and all of the Sith into you. Wait, no, I'm sorry. That's the wrong movie. It's now your duty to terrorize these people of the valley. Yeah. Like, what's the gamble? Give me back the IOUs, and I'll just, re- <laughs> I'll, I'll fix your father's debt. And he does it. He's like, ah, oh, you've succeeded, young Padawan. Your training is complete. Yeah, do it. Do it. Strike me down. I am the Sith. Fuck all those other people. Give me the IOUs. <laughs> I am Halloween. It's like they think they defeat him. They come back next year. He's like, what is that fucking thing he says in Revenge of the Sith? He's like, the Sith never death, blah, 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 immortality. Uh, Samhain never dies. They wouldn't come back in a year. They'd come back in like 30 or 40, and he'd be, he'd be back. He'd be fine. No problem. Yeah, he'd, he'd just have charred fingers after being thrown into a fucking core of a battle station. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. He gets thrown down a fucking hole to hell and comes back, yep. So, uh, so, so Kimball and Billy leave, and we're introduced to Muldoon and his son. And this is what Sean was talking about before. This guy is completely broken up about this fact. Like, he's been dreading this day all year. And it's not the first time. Look, he lives a he lives a stressful lifestyle, okay? His brother was murdered by raptors in some island by some, you know, some millionaire <laughs> owns. He's like, they should all be destroyed. <laughs> Just real quick, this guy's played by Eddie Jones, and he's in a ton of shit that I didn't even realize. He's in uh, Q the Winged Serpent, uh, he's the Watchman in, Qu- in in Q the Winged Serpent, and he's fucking uh, the Chief in Chud. Is he really? Which I thought was interesting. Yeah! Uh, he's in The New Kids is Charlie, um, he's Cassidy in Invasion USA, he was in that 90s Dark Shadows too. <laughs> As a matter of fact. Oh, the Rocketeer? Yeah, A League of Their Own, Sea Biscuit for Christ's sake, The Terminal. And he just recently he was on Veep. Uh, he goes from Tales from the Dark Side to fucking, you know, Terminal or, or Veep, you know, working with Tom Hanks or whatever. But yeah, like Sean was saying before, you know, Muldoon's like, he's like, he's like, ah, we're gonna, we're gonna beat you, Mr. C.A., Mr. Hackles. Yes, sir. I've toughened up my boy with the strap. I beat the shit out of him so he won't be scared of your demons and ghosts or whatever. Beat you at your own game. I summon the ghosts of his forefathers and I just have them haunt him every night. Uh, this is when it really comes through that he's like, this goes beyond like a prank. When it's like, these people actually like, hate this guy. Hackle's kind of like, he doesn't see it that way. Like in his mind, he's like, what? what's the problem? I'm just having some fun on Halloween, even though you're indebted to me. Yeah. Let me spook your kids. What's the big deal? Jesus wept. <laughs> meet my meet my Cenobites that guard my house. Um, oh no. Um, uh, also, it seems like the people are maybe convinced that he has uh, like supernatural abilities, or at least can like you know can summon them because his. I mean, he's got his thumb on all their necks. Yeah. Um. Uh. But it seems like the fear comes from the fact that he's like, oh, don't piss off the spirits. Sure. Especially this first little girl that we see, because well, he goes home first. 
And there's like this comment when he's talking to his accountants about how he doesn't ever put his money in the bank because he can't trust anybody. So he runs and he puts his money in the bank and is safe. I don't trust banks. They make mistakes. And then he, uh, what does he do next? Then he gets, he gets set up, right? Yeah, he basically sets up his fucking house of horrors. And um, just real quick, we get a little scene in between with um, Kimball and his wife, uh, Sarah, who's played by Brenda Curran. Um, and she's, it's funny, there's a couple people, uh, from Chud, because she plays the landlady from Chud, um, and she's also in Life with Mikey? Really? The fucking movie with, uh, 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 Michael J. Fox? Yeah, and yeah, that yeah, little yeah, girl. yeah, yeah. Um, and she's in Happy Death Day to You, which is fucking weird, I thought that was just so strange. Uh, but yeah, we get little Billy and he here overhears his parents talking and they're like, oh, you know, we, you know, we, we built this farm together and we're going to lose together and we're going to lose everything together and we'll just work again and, and start it because he's not going to subject his kid to that bullshit because fuck you. You know, if you want to take it, take it. I don't give a goddamn. We'll, we'll start again. Uh, but Billy's like, no, I could do it. Like, I'm not scared of Mr. Ackles. Like, I can get those fucking IOUs, dad. So he has his own little fucking side quest to go to the house without his parents knowing. Right. And you also do see Hackles hide those IOUs, just like I was kind of mentioning a little bit earlier, behind the fireplace, like a foot and a half deep. Well, yeah, he puts it in the flue of the of the um, right. of the fireplace, which is pretty obvious spot. I would never think of that. <laughs> Straight up, no. Especially as a dumbass kid, no way. Well, it it's this. See, this is also like a period piece too, because like it seems like everybody is like it's very old school type of shit. Like I would assume, pe like this is the this is where people were like pulling up like a couple floorboards and like putting shit underneath the floor, and you know what I mean. Ah, uh, yeah, maybe in that. Yeah, maybe you're on to something. Um, and especially if the fireplace wasn't lit. I would go directly for it. Yeah, that's fair then. Uh, I don't know. I have I have uh, anxiety about reaching into things that I just can't see. Well, <laughs> me too, Connor. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, what no spider thanks. is in there that could bite me that I can't it's, see? Yeah, I'm like, good. It's, it looks like a fireplace chimney, but in my head, I reach in my hand and there's 11 xenomorphs all ready to take my hand off. <laughs> Oh, those little ghouls from House, yeah, they're up there pulling up that little kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're all up there. Everything. There's a fucking graboid. Everything is up there. <laughs> So, so yeah, so, so it's Halloween night now and Hackles is all set up in his little fucking, you know, uh, uh, control room and he's got like a spyglass that runs all the way to the front door so he could see who's there. And he's got like all these, like, he's got like these Frankenstein laboratory fucking levers and pumps and shit that work all the gags in his house. I love it because it's just, it, it, it's so Wizard of Oz. He's like, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Like. Pretty much. And he has, like, it's so great because he has this giant, like, uh, it, it almost looks like a gramophone uh, horn, and he, like, and he talks into it, and that's, like, a PA system in the house. Yeah, and this is, like, where all his, like, invention making comes into play. Like, everything he was talking yeah. about earlier, my inventions and everything, it's all just for scaring kids. This is, um, he, he <laughs> this man spends his time inventing things to scare children. My creative energy is spent on tormenting small children. <laughs> you think Walt Disney called them up and was like, hey, we're putting this attraction together called the Haunted Mansion. You ever heard of a guy named H.H.? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we like what you're doing, but dial it back. <laughs> yeah, turn it down a little bit. Don't actually eat the kids. What are you doing? Yeah, don't don't kill anyone. He's like, oh, oh, oh well then. <laughs> Disregard the previous two days. Uh, I never cheat. I never eat. I never eat the children. Don't worry. I oh, he mentions that before. He's like, I never harmed a single hair on a single head. I just fucked them up uh, psychologically. Yeah, because this first little girl comes in. Come in. Bessie, and this little, this poor little girl goes in, and uh, oh man, this is such a great line because she comes and knocks on the door, and she's like, "Trick or treat, Mister Hackles," and he's like, "Trick or treat? Uh, I've never been a treated to anything in my entire life." I, I do like that he has to stop and just give like a short speech through in every situation, like. But it's a but it's a great way to tell that story of that character. No, I love it. I think it's hysterical, and it's it does flesh him out, but like. It's so over dramatic at times. I love it because it's like you just said. He's always like, he's like, I never hurt anyone. Blah blah blah. And then Bessie's here, and he's and then he has to fucking speechify to himself in there. He's such a good villain. Like, 
<laughs> it just it just adds that layer where it's like, okay, this guy is really fucking like sad and depressed, and he's just like taking it out on these kids. Yeah, he also loves the sound of his own voice, and he's extremely self-absorbed. So he's like, I've worked for my fortune, and so should you. Come on into my fucking house of horrors. Yeah, the girl's like eight years old. Yeah. Nobody gave me nothing. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, there's goblins out there tonight. She's like, goblins? He reminds me of Scrooge. Oh, my legs hurt. My back hurts. I'm only four. <laughs> Go out and buy yourself a choo-choo. I didn't get any Halloween candy when I was little, and now I spend my years tormenting you children. Well, go figure. Hey. Trick or treat. He didn't get his fucking weenie whistle, okay? <laughs> Imagine if Judge Reinhold had a fucking house of horrors. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so yeah, he scares the shit out of her, and, and she runs out of the house. Then there's some other kids that come, and they get scared. You know, a fucking bat flies at them and shit, and there's all spooky sounds and stuff. And the whole time these kids are in there, he's, like, narrating to them. He's like, he's like, oh, welcome to the house. Welcome to the house. It's the scary house. He's like, what's that? Is that something in the corner or whatever? And then he like hits a lever and like something flies out or like a moan happens or some shit. Yeah, he's Jigsaw. Yeah, and he's just like eating it up. He's loving it. Oh, he's fucking licking his lips, man. Because that Muldoon kid shows up. <laughs> oh my god. Dad looks drunk, sweating. Uh, come on, come on, little little boy. Come on, uh, do this for daddy. He's like, oh, Robert Muldoon, I've been waiting for you. Come on in, little fucker. And he, like, lets him in. I heard about your brother. <laughs> your uncle's your dead. Uncle, he was killed by lizards. <laughs> yeah, people keep just keep sending their kids over here. It's like, all right, we're going to do it this year. Well, yeah, they're making, they, like, they, they dress their kids up and they make them go into this fucking house because, I mean, when you think about it, it's like, these people are poorer than poor, like literally no money and are living on credit. And they make a he makes a comment uh, in the beginning about oh poor crops this year, huh? And it's like this motherfucker set up shop in this place where you couldn't fucking grow or be prosperous on purpose. And then like these people moved in and that's it. They started once they start borrowing from them, they can't leave, you know. I'm surprised somebody hasn't murdered him yet, to be honest. Now, I was just going to say that, especially this Muldoon character. He looks so fucking unhinged the whole time. I'm surprised he didn't pull a uh, Desert Eagle on this guy or something. Yeah, I'm I'm surprised that this town didn't just, like, Ken Re- uh, what was it, Ken Rex McElroy, this guy, and just shoot him in broad daylight, and then no one fesses up to it. Oh, dude, just lynch him quietly? Like, they fucking Freddy Krueger him? They throw a fucking flaming uh, a Molotov cocktail through his shop window? Just burn him to death? Well, and of course, you have to have somebody throws the I.O use into the fire but no we don't get that instead we get this kid who his father tells him their spirits aren't real so he thinks that that's gonna help him out but it doesn't but daddy you have spirits in the cabinet <laughs> they're on your breath dad <laughs> uh but no but like it's a whole thing too because like he this guy against his own will has beat his kid to scare to make his kid his kid more scared of him than he is of this house yeah i mean that's what he's telling himself for sure and he's basically like you don't he's yeah he's basically like you don't if you come out of there without those fucking ious there's a this, you're in a world of hurt you know what i'm saying yeah yeah it gets a little dark right there yeah and they do it in a way where it's subtle but it's totally effective you know so tim gets in there tim muldoon gets in there and this little motherfucker man his will is strong as fuck and he actually says, hey, look at that fireplace. And he goes up there and he reaches his hand up there and he's like, uh, he's like a fucking hair away from touching those IOUs and grabbing them. Yeah, he's close. Yeah. And and the whole time Hackles is like, oh, you're cold, you're freezing. And he's fucking pulling every lever and switch he can to scare the shit out of this kid. Um, And he finally does uh, and distracts him. And then he walks away from the fireplace and then, you know gets scared by um, the fucking bear from the Adams family. Yeah. Yeah, he, well, he, he didn't get to use his ultimate weapon, which is Mr. Boogity that he sealed off in some jar. Uh, yeah, he's in there somewhere. <laughs> I was thinking that, too. He's in a vacuum, dude. There's a vacuum between the corners, just, like, ominously glowing green. <laughs> we don't turn that on anymore. Leave it alone. You'll, you'll let him out, and he'll speak, and that will be the end of it. John Astin's fucking walking around <laughs> somewhere, babadooking, somewhere in that house. Oh, he's being dusty somewhere for sure with a fucking uh, one of those Russian hats on. So yeah, there's like the you know the scare bear pops out. Muldoon goes running, and his dad's just like, "Did you get the papers or whatever?" And 
they just break down and the kid jumps in the the father's arms and they're both like crying and shit and you know hackles comes out to fucking revel in their you know them being scared or whatever and he's just like i it's a backwards play it's a backwards town everybody's backwards here they don't get it they don't understand and it's like dude you are seriously fucking warped yeah, they have compassion they care about each other what the fuck's wrong with them <laughs> <laughs> Nobody hugged me when I was a kid. I never got a treat. Never. So the best part of this series is it's always usually some scumbag motherfucker that gets his comeuppance, just like those old EC comics, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's always a twist. There's always the comeuppance. And uh, yeah, the ending is always like flipped on its side. So then we get this, uh, you know, the Scrooge reference go, you know, comes full fucking circle in some ways. Uh, maybe not in the uh, not for the benefit of Mr. Uh, Hackles because uh, there's a witch at the door. I love this. <laughs> uh, that voice. Oh, trick or treat. <laughs> She's fucking creepy, man. The makeup on this is like fantastic, especially for like a TV show. Yes, and this was also where I where I finally found out that the voice clip from our Trick or Trash uh, opening <laughs> was from this show. Um, There's actually two from this particular episode. Yes! <laughs> Him saying it's Halloween, didn't you know? And then the witch cackling, I think, Trick or Treat, if I'm not mistaken. At the end, yeah. And the Halloween candy episode, there's a clip from that at the end, uh, too. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll know. Okay, I can't wait to hear that. But yeah, she's floating in the air. She's, you know, that, you know, stereotypical, you know, think of like Helga the Witch from Looney Tunes almost with the, basically that boy with like a really like uh, grotesque face. Yeah, staring right into the door. Yeah. yeah, right into his little eyepiece. And he's like looking through it. He's like, who's that? Is that Muldoon? Is that whatever? And it's like, does that fucking look <laughs> like that? Like a person? Are you a very tall child? He's like, well, no adults on Halloween. There's never any adults. Yeah, no treats for adults tonight, only children. Oh, real quick. She's played by Fran Francis Cheney. I really wanted to like, deep dive into these people because I'm like, where? what happened? You know, who, who did they become anybody? Have they done anything else? Uh, so Francis Cheney plays the witch. Um, no relation to Lon Cheney, but um, she is the ex-mother-in-law of Tommy Lee Jones. <laughs> Okay. Oh, that's a, yeah, that is a deep dive. And she plays Mrs. Cantrell in Life with Mikey. Uh, if she has a relation to Lon Chaney, then did she shoot someone in the face while quail hunting? And that would make her related to Dick Chaney? Ah, it's possible. Oh, maybe. Maybe it's spelled the same way. So she, so he finally goes to the door to confront this fucking witch. And, uh, you know, the fucking door flies open and she's levitating. <laughs> On a fucking broom. Yep. And this guy's like, oh, shit. Yeah, this is where we go, like, full, like, nightmare mode. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I love this because, like, it's his come up with is just like, what what forces have come to take this man and make him pay for his crimes? Horror. Just the forces of horror. Everything. <laughs> Evil, darkness, shadow, whatever. Everything. Halloween. Salwin TM has yeah, come like, to just, make him pay. The idea of spooky has come to take this man away. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's pretty great because he loves it so much and now he's fucking getting it from that. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Who is your who's your effects person? The levitating is very convincing. <laughs> <laughs> I grab, Where's your strings? So this fucking witch like levitates and, and uh, fucking like zaps the chimney and the IOUs fucking blow out of the chimney and they're flying all over the place. And... Um, um, you know, the, the safe opens and all this golden shit flies out. And at this point, he just loses his fucking mind and he shuts down. He is so terrified. He's just trying to grab these IOUs and cash and stuff. And he's just like, money, my money, my money, not my money, ah, my money. I love this this insane climax because it's, it starts with a witch and you're like, where did you come from? And then it just, without any warning, escalates to Satan himself. Um, you're missing zombie pirate. Yeah, can't forget the pirate. Oh, I'm so, oh how can I forget the zombie pirate? <laughs> Excuse me. Zombie pirate is in the control room, like, wearing all his jewelry that was in the safe. And he's like, ha, ha, fuck you, Gideon. That was Gramps. He, he went on a different path. <laughs> After, uh, you know, he was left in the uh, mortal realm after Charlie and the gang went back into that, like, western fucking dimension. I've just been walking and walking and walking. How the hell are you, Gideon? <laughs> Um, <laughs> Gideon's like, oh no! So, like you guys said, this fucking this door opens, and it's literally a tunnel to hell, and yeah. all of his money is like flying down it, and uh, he's crawling into it, like chasing his money straight to hell. 
Uh, big metaphor. <laughs> yeah, it's like red lights flashing, wind blowing everywhere. All his money and gold are flying at him. And he's just he's just losing his mind. Oh, yeah. I love the makeup they did on this uh, Satan character. It's just like they went all out for this like 15 seconds of footage. Okay, this is something really spectacular. Yeah, here we go. Here's a fun little trivia. So the devil guy here is actually Ed French. He sure he is. is a, he does like makeup special effects. And his credits are like all over the place. He's um, a big one was Terminator 2. Mm. He's um, he did that. He's also in. Uh, an, oh, another one, Joe. Chud. Chud. It's all over this movie. Yeah. He did work for Chud. Uh, Dead Time Stories. Uh, Nightmares in a Damaged Brain. He worked on that crew. Uh, the Stuff. He did Breeders. Mutant Hunt is another one. Uh, and Blood Rage. And Creep Show too. Yeah, so this guy is like, it's one of those faces where it's like you wouldn't recognize him, but he's been around. Like he's done a lot of stuff. Oh yeah, that that's a lot of movies with some good effects for sure. Great effects, really. Yeah, and here he is just like hamming it up, playing the devil. It's great. And if you've seen Blood Rage, and if you haven't seen it, definitely go check it out. And that episode we did, wink, wink. Oh yeah, remember that two years ago? Blood Rage? Go listen to it. But no, but Ed French is actually in Blood Rage as well. And you know that, do you, do you guys remember the chick who has like the baby and like brings that nerd home? Yes. The nerd is Ed French. Oh. And he's like, uh, and he's like, oh, coconut liqueur. That fucking guy? That's him. Yeah, 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 yeah. When he gets his head cut off? Yeah, that's, yeah, the head hanging outside the door. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Oh, yes. Um, I'm, I'm going to add that, uh, even to this day, the effects in Terminator 2 are like, untouchable like it still looks so good oh they're amazing oh sure yeah stan winston baby that team was amazing and so he fucking just crawl literally crawls into a hole into hell chasing his money into the afterlife and the door closes and then uh billy has got his balls up kim uh ken uh kimball's son billy and he's like i can do it i can really do it he goes up to this fucking door. He's like, "Oh, trick or treat, Mr. Hackles, motherfucker! Open up this door. I- I'm gonna, I'm gonna get those IOUs. I'm gonna come in there and get the shit out of you, old man." <laughs> He's like, "I'm not scared of you." The door opens, and it's the fucking witch. This thing is terrifying looking. And this kid's like, "I know it's you, Mr. Hackles. You can't scare me, man." Yeah, he finally gets the courage to go back to the house, and you know, uh, just like you know, finally take care of the stuff for his family. And there's a witch that opens the door. Yeah. <laughs> Hackles. Yeah, he's like, you're not fooling me. Yeah. <laughs> and he, so the witch has all the IOUs, and she's like picking them out and like throwing them at him. And then she like levitates and flies away and just starts throwing all the money and jewels to this kid so that, you know, his family could be prosperous and the town could be prosperous again, you know? Uh, all, all of the debt that all those people were in and all of that money and stuff that he had taken from them and basically taken their lives away is given back to them, which is pretty amazing. It's very, it's very generous of these forces of darkness to show up and start being <laughs> charitable. <laughs> yeah, They're hella nice, right? The ghosts of Halloween spirit. Yeah. <laughs> This is the nicest cabal of evil people I've ever seen, or evil entities I've ever seen in my life. They show up, they drag the miser to hell, and then distribute his wealth to the citizens? Fuck yeah, come on. Well, you know, like like we saw in Petey Wheatstraw, you know, the forces of evil being used to help out uh, people in your neighborhood, so you just never know, Connor. This is true. Satan's like, I was Robin Hood my previous life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting warmer. So, uh, so yeah, this kid fucking trots away with a big arm full of IOUs and, and money and stuff back to his, his folks' house, back to his farm. And uh, as he walks away, the camera pans down to his to uh, a, a gravestone. Gideon Hackles. He took it with him when he went, it says. Yeah, it says Gideon Hackles, businessman. He took it with him when he went. Yeah, that's the whole thing, I think. And uh, which is like just so uh, it's just so weird the way it's written like that. He took it with him. It's like, doesn't say his wealth or anything, just says, that's all it says. Super, it's kind of ominous, actually, because, like, I don't know. Yeah. You get 30 years later, you walk by and go, like, the fuck is it? <laughs> his fucking greed and, 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 uh, I don't know, all of the hate, I guess, that he put into the world he took with him? Fuck him. Also, curious that you walk by and be like, well, that guy's headstone is in his front yeah, yard. Directly <laughs> in front of his house. <laughs> in front of his house. Uh, he took the IOUs with him? Question mark. Maybe? Maybe he's hanging out with that fucking zombie pirate now for all eternity, getting stabbed with a pitchfork. And I guess the witch just, like, lives in his house now because she answered the door. <laughs> I guess she gives out candy. Took over. Every year people show up and she just gives them money for Halloween. Yeah, throws pearl necklaces at them. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, 
this is this is a brought to you by uh show so we're not going to do like where is this in a dumpster or whatever but we we i would like us to go around and kind of give our thoughts on 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 each episode um so if somebody would like to start uh yeah um it's pretty good uh especially in terms of like i don't know it just it's it's evocative of of uh are you afraid of the dark the goosebumps tv series all those other anthology shows i've seen there's a certain layer of like hokiness that all of them seem to have that's very present but then like once the once it's wrapping up you're like oh you're just diving headlong into this ridiculous premise and i really love it um and then i kind of love the ending because it's for some reason it makes me think of like something like haunted mansion where it's like his headstone with this ridiculous phrase is just planted in his front yard um it's such a silly concept but i love it um and i think a lot of these anthologies like they might have dead serious episodes they also have stuff like this that is like it's got some serious shit going there but it's kind of like it, it's campy and wonderful so yeah this is pretty fun um i mean i like this quite a bit actually i mean i, I was poking fun a little bit at uh as i was watching it the randomness of the comeuppance but uh i was kind of pretty okay with it especially for a 22 minute program i'm like you know what they don't have enough time to explain this it's just happening because fuck this guy and uh it's pretty fucking amazing i'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the series i uh yeah i, I that's also really good to say i guess so far it's on the shelf we'll see where it uh, goes from here it's a nice like fun ride with this whole series it's like especially right out the gate with the pilot it's like you have uh you know starts off as a drama but then we go just full-blown you know supernatural horror right at the end out of nowhere like you said sean yeah and it it, it, it fits weirdly enough like it works it gels really well together and uh that's kind of the beauty of the series it's like they get to do a lot of fun little you know uh twists like that and uh that's kind of the the allure of watching more of these it's like just to see what these weird twists are yeah absolutely and like f- <sighs> this is such a powerful pilot like they they kind of hit all of those hallmarks of this series in one episode right you get a little bit of comedy you get a, you get some of that drama and you get some of that supernatural horror elements to it so it's kind of like it's kind of like a it's kind of like a best of um compilation and i guess and i and, and they and they kind of they fucking nailed it i mean they they syndicated the series after this the following year so um this particular episode in general, um, just from like production standpoint, I think it it's really nice to look at. Like I feel like, especially for this time period, uh, TV shows in general, uh, the lighting is really good and and um the cinematography is pretty good too. Some of some of the stuff they kind of do, and the effects are fucking off the charts for for a a made for TV show, like like an episodic show, not like a um, you know an hour special or some kind of I don't know what. You know, we kind of take that kind of thing for granted now, but um, you know, I feel like this is such a good uh, first step. Um, in in this series going like going forward um setting the tone and such um and i really like the way that this series deals with um particularly satan and the devil as we go through this series you're going to see a lot of variations of this character told from different ways which is really um interesting yeah there's all sorts of fun little angles you have uh, the devil's advocate episode oh yeah, yeah. The Devil's Advocate episode, uh, the uh, the one where uh, well, I don't want to spoil too much, but but yeah, but totally. There, at one point, Satan is like a like a uh, he's almost represented as like a construction worker guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it's very interesting. Um, but as far as tone goes, this first this first season's uh, pr- pretty pretty serious for the most part. And and when, once we get to the next episode, we're going to see a little bit more of that drama come full full through. Um, Along with that supernatural kind of uh, twist, uh, what have you, Twilight Zoney kind of kind of feel. But yeah, it's a fucking banger of of a, of a first episode. I mean, technically, it's not the first episode if you want to get technical. It's 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 zero zero. You know, the pilot, whatever. But you know, it's the first episode of Tales from the Dark Side. But right at the gate, have, starting with a Halloween episode, it's like you're setting the stage. You're kind of you're getting everyone ready for what's ahead. Yeah, that seed that grow that grows into four seasons of content and then a fucking movie. You know what I mean? Uh, 
and and gives birth to all those and subsequently to like monsters again and like the creep show revival and all that kind of shit so it's 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 ground zero <laughs> and it was it's yeah. excellent it's fantastic yeah and there's uh you know the stories are all over the place and everything sort of has that it's like yeah it's a, it's low budget and sure you can call it cheap or whatever but it's c- so comfy and uh and they're all just so much fun it's so comfy there's always there's always a uh, uh uh, uh, they're almost always like a morality tale, right? And most of the time, usually the bad guy gets the comeuppance, and usually the bad guy nine times out of ten is a hu- is a human person. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so 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 that so that's it for our first episode of Talks from the Dark Side. I hope you everybody's enjoyed it, and uh, we got more coming. There'll be obviously shorter format because we wanted to tackle all of the um, behind the scenes uh, and history of the show. So this is kind of like our our two hour premiere, if you will. And um, and yeah, hope you come and stick around. And um, till next time, I'm Joel Escola. I'm Sean O'Rourke. I'm Connor McGraw. I'm Chris Barr. The dark side is always there, waiting for us to enter, waiting to enter us. Until next time, try to enjoy the daylight. <laughs>